Now we're going to move into today's webinar presentation. And before we begin, I just want to let you know who is joining us today. We have uh, Likwa Nkala from East, East Metro Youth Services, excuse me, based in Toronto. Um, Likwa will be joining us a little later on in today's presentation. We also have Miles Solier from New Beginnings in Windsor. And our facilitator for part one and part two is my colleague Vivian Ostrick from our Northern Hub uh, in Sudbury, where she is our Youth Program Supports Manager. And I'm going to turn it over now to Vivian to move into the content for today's presentation. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part one of the two-part webinar, webinar series, <clears throat> Using the Stages of Change to Support Young People. I'm excited to be here today. So in this first part, we're going to provide you with a general overview of the trans theoretical model of behavior change a little bit about the background of the TTM and the research supporting it. And we're also going to discuss the central organizing construct of the TTM model, which is the stages of change. So by the end of this two-part series, you will be able to understand the four main constructs of the TTM, including the stages of change. You'll be able to describe the characteristics of youth in each of the different stages. You'll be able to understand which TTM principles and processes to use with youth at each of the stages. And you'll also know how to use motivational interviewing to complement the TTM processes. So a little bit about the TTM and why it's unique compared to other interventions. So most interventions are designed for people who are ready to change. But research shows us that a majority of people, including youth, who are engaging in healthy behaviors aren't ready. So one of the key features of the TTM is that it has something for everyone, regardless of their readiness. The TTM behavior change programs are designed for entire populations, not just merely the minority, who are ready. The TTM can be and has been applied to all kinds of behaviors and populations, from bullying prevention among elementary school to smoking sensations among adults. Another key feature of the TTM is that it's based in over 35 years of research. The general model evolved out of and has been validated over and over again in rigorous research. The model is called transtheoretical because it draws from and integrates many different theories of behavior change that are often considered incompatible. So the model had its beginnings back 35 years ago when Dr. James Prochaska at the University of Rhode Island asked his psychology graduate students to examine 24 systems of psychotherapy. He asked them to identify the basic types of change within these 24 systems and how they relied on change. That list was eventually distilled down to 10 basic strategies, which are called the processes of change. And we're going to be discussing those in detail in part two. Now I'm going to ask Miles if you can tell us a little bit about how you came to adopt this model at New Beginnings and why. Uh, sure. So thank you for having me today. Um, New Beginnings is a multi-service organization in Windsor. Um, we provide supports to children, youth, and their families through a wide variety of programs. Um, one of our larger programs is our Provincial Youth Outreach Worker Program. Uh, it's in select communities across Ontario. And um, one of the um, models that we actually use is the Stages of Change um, model. There's a database behind it and everything. So I guess uh, a bit of it was forced upon us. Um, but New Beginnings about uh, seven years ago really did start to look at a uh, strengths-based approach to the work that we're doing. And I think that probably most people on this call would identify their organizations as identifying with a, a strengths-based approach. But what we really wanted to do was we really wanted to live and breathe that. So we really wanted to push um, more strengths-based um, supports for young people that we're working with. Um, so this model, certainly when we, when we were kind of looking at it as adopting it for a youth outreach worker program, really did speak to um, that strengths-based approach that we were hoping to include in a lot of our programs across our agency. Um, looking at the stages of change model, uh, it does help organize our work. Uh, it does prioritize tasks. Um, it's youth-driven and goal-driven, um, and it forces us, um, forces it to not be about us, but rather about the young person that we're working with. Um, so we've really taken this and run. Um, we've incorporated into other programs um, that we have here at New Beginnings, um, and we've really seen a lot of benefits from it. So that's why I'm here today, just to kind of speak about some of our experiences and um, really uh, hopefully be able to solidify uh, the, the positives and the benefits behind it. 
Great, thanks Miles, and thank you for joining us. So the TTM model consists of four main constructs. We're gonna to start today by talking about the stages of change, which describes when youth change. We're also gonna talk about decisional balance, which describes why youth change, and self-efficacy, which speaks to the confidence needed to change. Again, in part two on April 3rd, we're gonna discuss the processes of how people change and go through the stages. Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, for those of you that work with youth, change is not easy. They experience many different social barriers and obstacles to change. And so as we work through this webinar, we're gonna ask you to think about the different concepts of the TTM in your own life situations, and maybe try to apply those to your own struggles with behavior change or to maybe the struggles of other family members or friends that you are close to. Next slide, please. Okay. So like we said earlier, the stages of change is the main organizing construct of the TTM. Studies have shown us that people move through a series of stages as they move along their behavioral change journey. While the time that people spend in each stage differs, the process by which they go through doesn't. So certain principles and processes of change work best at each stage, and this helps to reduce resistance and helps to facilitate progress and prevent people from relapsing. So the stages of change model tells you when people change and how successful they'll be when they try. So many of the young people, like I said, that we work with experience multiple barriers to change. And sometimes they can't change the social structures that they're in, but we can help them change their stages of change. And if we can help a youth change the stage of change, then we can increase the likelihood that they will succeed. Even if the young person isn't ready to change, they can understand that they can get there using this and that we have a roadmap for them. Once we know their stage of change, we can match feedback and, and offer them guidance to their readiness. So we're going to walk through the different stages, starting with pre-contemplation to contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and then termination. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the pre-contemplation stage, this is where you'll see youth that aren't ready to act. They don't have any intention to take action in the foreseeable future. And we generally define that as in the next six months. So these are youth that aren't ready to change or don't foresee themselves changing any time in the next six months. And this is because the cons or the costs or disadvantages of changing outweigh the pros and benefits for them. If we push or insist youth to change in this stage, they may become defensive or resistant they might make excuses or minimize the problem. And this can cause them to feel demoralized because they feel they can't, or perhaps they've tried in the past and failed, and they feel that this goal is just too far out of reach. So it's particularly challenging in the pre-contemplation stage to know exactly what or how to support youth. So Miles, I'm wondering if I can turn to you to provide us with an example of a youth in this stage and how the model works for those youth who are not ready to change or who may not be able to be served through other traditional services that require a youth to be ready to take action? Uh, for sure. So I, I think when we're talking about stages of change, uh, I guess the first issue that may come up with a lot of people is um, maybe around addictions um, and, and, you know, those kind of things. So um, I, I think maybe for this example, I might, I might actually use that. Um, so if we're looking at a young person who might be um, experiencing an, addi an addiction issue, um, they might not identify that as being an issue, um, but in this pre-contemplation stage, it really does allow us um, and our staff here to be able to build that rapport with that young person um, and, and really start talking about a harm reduction approach is what we use at New Beginnings. Um, so instead of the traditional model of going into detox and then um, a residential treatment program, if that's what they're identifying as their goal, um, we might start talking about and introducing the idea of some harm reduction approaches, making sure they have clean supplies and that sort of thing. Um, just to be able to build that rapport, to be able to support that change um, if they do want to move forward with that. Um, an important key part of this is that we accept at this point that they're not ready for that change, um, but we start to build on, um, you know, some of the strengths that they may be identifying through some of that rapport building that we're, um, we're working with them through. Um, so it's, it's really for us, it's not a linear program. 
Um, it's not a linear kind of stage of change, but for us, it's more of uh, being able to support that young person where they're at um, and be able to help uh, move them along that spectrum and uh, be able to build some of those knowledge pieces behind it um, and also building the rapport so that when they are ready to move forward with that, uh, with that change, uh, they know that they can depend on us and that we're there to support them. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so throughout the webinar, we're gonna be asking you these reflective type questions and some other questions to kind of get you thinking about how to use the stages of change in your work and also to kind of um, see where you're at in your learning. So our first set of reflection questions are gonna ask, and Miles spoke to this a little bit, uh, what can we do for people or youth in the pre-contemplation stage? Should we offer them traditional interventions? Should we put them back on waiting lists or ask them to come back when they're ready? What types of strategies do you think or maybe perhaps you've used with youth in this stage that would be beneficial? Next slide, please. Okay. So in the contemplation stage, you'll see youth that are starting to get ready to change or they plan on taking some kind of action in the next six months. So the pros have gone up a little bit for them, but the cons for continuing with the behavior are still very high. So in this stage, you might say you see youth who are still ambivalent towards change, or you might perceive that there is a lack of commitment or, or confidence. Um, and they may be stuck in this stage for some time as they're thinking about whether or not they want to actually commit to the change journey. And it's not uncommon in research studies to see people kind of stuck in this stage for up to two years before they're ready to start preparing to go on that change journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the preparation stage, this is where people and youth are now ready they're starting to take small steps and they intend to take action in the next 30 days. These are young people perhaps who've signed up for programs and are starting to think about what types of steps they can take towards reaching their goals. In the contemplation stage that we just talked about, the pros and the cons were high, but in the preparation stage, the cons have now come down a bit and the pros are starting to outweigh the cons. So there isn't as much ambivalence or tension. So youth in the preparation stage have a plan and they may be ready to take these steps and they're being more decisive and more committed. They're also more confident, which is important. They might still be experiencing some anxiety, which is natural and normal, but generally they're starting to feel more ready. So these are your ideal participants. They're motivated and they're ready to go. So that being said, what are some of the ways we can support youth who are preparing for action? If you can think about that, and maybe you have supported youth in this stage, what are some things that would help them be more successful moving forward? Next slide. Okay, so, Youth in action are actually making the behavior change, and they've been meeting an action criteria for less than six months. Youth in the action stage are at high risk of relapse and slipping back into an earlier stage. They may slip because they set goals that were unrealistic or inappropriate, or they may have not done enough prep work in the forefront. So their cons may be too high, and their pros may not be high enough, and you have to gauge and assess that as you go. Youth in the action stage can give up quite easily, so they require a lot of support, and it can be in a very intense stage to work with youth. So Miles, maybe if I can go back to you again to speak to the intensity of the action phase and how best we can support youth in developing an action plan that is realistic for them. Uh, for sure. So. Um, I think this is probably where we see uh, a lot of the work actually um, with the young people we're working with. Um, once we're kind of in the action pieces of it, um, if we look at like a housing thing for uh, a housing situation for a young person, for example, 
Um, at this point, we're, we're, we're working with that young person to help them find housing and that sort of thing. Uh, but then also developing um, what those escape plans might be. So if something does fall through, um, maybe they have a room to rent with a friend or they're crashing on a couch and that falls through. We want to make sure that they have something to fall back on so that they're not completely without those kind of supports. And also know that if that something does regress, that they are able to come uh, back to us for that type of support as well. So um, that intensity, um, you know, we've spent uh, 40 hours, a 40 hour work week with a young person um, at times where our time is completely developed uh, or de uh, devoted to them. Um, and other times it might be a bi-weekly check-in, it might be a couple of times a week check-in, uh, depending on the circumstance and the situation. So I think the really unique thing about this uh, model is that it really does allow us to customize it for whatever that you um, might be able uh, to need from us. Additionally, um, we're always looking at the strengths for that young person as well. So um, if their strength is independence, they may need less intensity, but if um, they don't have that strength and that's something that we can help them build, um, we can certainly um, bump up that intensity to be able to support that person with that change um, in that action phase. So um, you are right, it is absolutely, it can be very intense at this uh, circumstance um in this situation but we are always uh, able to kind of customize that support for that young person uh to be, be able to best support their needs at that point great thank you so just to reiterate um there are certain considerations for this this particular stage and it's important to remember that um, youth might easily slip into relapse um, and that they need to set um, appropriate goals and realistic goals for themselves. And it's really important to make sure that we continue to support them in seeing the pros or the advantages and benefits of changing. Next slide. So here we're going to offer a multiple choice question just to gauge where you're at in your learning. And the question is, which of the following statements are true from youth in action? So it looks like 11% um, of folks um, selected the first statement, my life is fine, I don't have any problems. 29% selected, this is one of the best things I've ever done. 13% selected, I don't even think about it anymore. 16% selected, part of me wants to change, but I'm okay with what I'm doing. And 80% of respondents selected the statement, this is harder than I thought, I'm not sure if I'll make it. Great. Great. So, in fact, there was two, um, appropriate responses and those were um, this is one of the best things I've ever done but also this is harder than I thought I'm not sure if I'll make it and we use those examples to illustrate that youth are going to experience the action stage differently you're going to have some youth that are more successful than others who are maintaining positivity and are really um, uh, happy with the fact that they've done this and then you're going to have youth that are going to have doubts and they're going to start to to question whether or not they made the right decision and that's where they're going to need that extra support uh, and encouragement and continued education about why they're they're making the right decision okay so now we moved on to the maintenance stage so in this stage um, youth have generally sustained the behavior change and have been meeting their action criteria for six months or longer. So in this stage, you'll see youth with high self-efficacy or they have a lot of confidence in their ability to maintain the behavior change. So things are dynamic, they're doing well, um, we're, they're going to be consolidating gains means, means they're building on their successes that um, they've accomplished to achieve even more. Um, you might see that their coping skills have improved significantly and they're using more positive coping skills. However, um, often youth can be in the maintenance stage for some time and in fact um, it can be a lifelong struggle for them depending on the change that they're trying to make. So they may stay in this stage um, for the rest of their life.
Next slide, please. So <clears throat> there is one last stage in the TTM called uh, termination. In this stage, um, there is zero temptation of relapse and the youth has total confidence. So the new behavior has become habit essentially and it's automatic. People reach um, termination once they've maintained the behavior change typically for five years or more. So an example of this would be somebody who uh, is required to take regular medication for a chronic condition. Um, maybe they have to take it at the same time every day, um, but it's become automatic. They have complete confidence and they're not likely going to relapse into old behaviors or old ways. So youth workers, social workers, counselors rarely need to intervene with youth or people in the termination stage. Um, unfortunately, not everyone reaches this stage with every behavior. Um, Again, many youth or people will stay in the maintenance stage for um, a very long time. Next slide, please. So, like we said earlier, relapse is um, more of a rule rather than an exception. Um, a small percentage of youth will relapse completely back to pre-contemplation, but generally they will relapse to an earlier stage at some point. And it's really important to take these relapses as learning opportunities and not failures and continue to get them back onto their action plan to pick up back up. And hopefully the uh, goal is that with every relapse, it becomes less traumatic or less impactful and they're able to get back into their behavior change journey quicker than the last time. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Miles to talk a little bit about um, relapse and the shape of change and what that might look for a youth who's experiencing that. And if you can go to the next slide for him, please. Uh, sure, so I think, um, as an organization adopting this model, it was probably one of the trickiest parts to accept. Um, the reason for that is, um, you know, I don't think as, uh, you know, clinicians, social workers, youth workers, whatever that might be, um, it, it's easy to often accept like people are, are, are going to regress or, um, you know, relapse down um, a stage. So uh, I think for us to wrap our head around it, um, it took us a while to kind of really sort all that out, what that looks like, and really accept that that's okay, um, and that's just part of the process. Um, so now that we've, we've had a couple of years of experience doing that, uh, we now actively plan for it. Um, we're always talking with youth um, and being able to build that rapport and those strengths from earlier um, stages um, really now comes into play um, to really talk about, okay, this didn't work out, um, and now let's move forward with, with this, this, and this, or um, let's look at your strengths and, and see what kind of uh, knowledge we've gained from from that um, relapse and be able to move forward with it. Um, we at, at this point, we always want to be that person that they um, they trust, um, that we're their go to person at that point. Um, and really, really, we want to talk about engaging other partners in this process as well. So um, if we have a plan to include other programs or other agencies with that young person, be able to wrap around with support, we want to engage them and really talk about um, this is what's happened. Um, and really um, help that young person be able to move forward with their with their new modified plan um, and be able to kind of continue their journey on the stages of change. Um, you know, we, we a lot of times when we're looking at relapse for us, um, they are only relapsing down one, um, one change. So if it's going from maintenance might be into action or, or action into preparation. Um, we see that a lot in our employment programs as well. Um, we're hearing that people are ready and they wanna do our employment program. Um, they really want to complete that training and then maybe they'll complete the training and then really not follow through with the job. We'll always give them that second and third and fourth chance um, and really um, try and give them the opportunity to uh, build more of those strengths uh, behind that so that if it does happen again, they have at least have more tools in their tool belt to be able to help address um, that relapse and be able to move forward with the, on that stage of change. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. So we want to talk a little bit about stage classification. 
and you've heard me say um, a couple times um, that the youth is generally ready to change or embark on their change journey in the next six months or the next 30 days. So these um, stages are assessed using a staging algorithm. And this was based on uh, smoking cessation research where researchers asked people whether they intended to quit smoking or not. And so they looked at people who said they were ready to quit smoking and when they actually started to take overt action. And that generally was around the six month period. So that's where the six month um, staging timeline comes from. So a good way to kind of gauge whether or not um, a, a youth is in a particular stage is by asking them a question. And um, the question around smoking, for example, is um, a good one to use as an example because it lets you say, for example, ask the question, um, have you quit smoking? And if the youth was to say, no, and I don't plan on quitting smoking in the next six months, then you know that they're in the pre-contemplation stage. Just like um, if they were to say, yes, I did, and I quit eight or nine months ago, then you know that they're now in the maintenance stage. So we just wanted to tell you or explain where those um, timelines are, are coming from. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, there's four main constructs of the trans theoretical model, and we just talked about the stages of change. And we're gonna talk about two other constructs, and those are decisional balance and self-efficacy. And these are important because it gives you some strategies on how to help youth move through the different stages. It gives you some tips on what types of things you can do to support them, to make sure that they move successfully from pre-contemplation to maintenance. Next slide, please. So decisional balance basically speaks to why youth change. It's the balance of the pros and cons that I referred to earlier. The pros are those perceived positive consequences that the youth have. They are the facilitators or what they think they'll gain from making the change. The cons are those perceived negative consequences. So what barriers does the youth think they'll have or what they think they'll lose from making the change. So in the pre-contemplation stage, the cons of changing the behavior outweigh the pros, which is why they're not ready to move on to change. In the later stages, the pros start to outweigh the cons and the crossover generally happens in the action stage. So in the earlier stages, it's important to help youth recognize the pros of changing if they can't see them. In the later stages, it's important to make sure that the cons aren't too high. If someone's cons are too high in the action or maintenance stage, he or she may wonder whether all of her work was worth it and they may relapse. So this idea around decisional balance was taken from the work of Janice and Maine, who published a book called Decision Making in the late 1970s. They found that people were more likely to be satisfied with the decision if they considered the potential pros and cons of that decision. So Miles, I'm wondering if I can turn it over to you to maybe talk about a strategy for increasing the pros and reducing the cons when working with youth. Um, sure. So um, I think for us, uh, again, going back to that strength-based approach really does allow us uh, to be able to look at that. Um, so I, I would say in terms of a strategy for increasing the pros, um, you know, certainly identifying what those strengths are uh, for that young person and then really being able to help provide some of that education behind it. So if it's um, about housing and, and the benefits of having a safe, secure place to live or getting back into the educational um, system about what that uh, high school diploma or uh, college or university um, education may be able to bring to that young person um, and being able to show them real life examples, I think, is really important for us. Um, and, and then in terms of uh, reducing the cons, um, we're always looking at risk um, at new beginnings here and, and the level of risk that we can assess a young person at um, and where they, they identify that uh, level of risk as well. Um, so the cons one is, is a little bit trickier to, to kind of navigate sometimes. 
um, because a lot of the times the youth uh, don't really understand or don't really see um, that it is uh, such a risky piece of behavior. Um, but uh, for us, it's about education, 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 um, and looking at those strengths and really relying on those strengths uh, to be able to increase those pros and reduce those cons at the end of the day. Um, and, and really understand that it's going to take time. Um, we're willing to invest the time um, and the energy uh, with that young person to be able to support them in a bit of a unique and different kind of way um, here. But, uh, you know, I, I really do think that at the end of the day, it does come down to where their strengths are right now um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, one key point to remember here, too, is uh, I was actually just in a presentation and uh, we were talking about strengths-based approach and the person presenting actually asked us to identify our own strengths, um, which was quite difficult uh, for everybody in the room. Um, so we're asking these young people to identify strengths right off the top. And if you ask them like that, it's not really going to be working. So um, really relying on some of your training around motivational interviewing would certainly help um, to be able to kind of uh, tweeze, out, uh, tease out some of those uh, those strengths and, and <coughs> excuse me, and really help uh, uh, develop that case for increasing those pros and reducing those cons. Great. Thanks, Maz. Okay, next slide, please. So the last construct that we're going to talk about in today's webinar is self-efficacy, and this is having the confidence to change. So this construct was adapted from Albert Bandura's self-efficacy theory. And self-efficacy is the belief in one's ability to achieve a desired goal, including the confidence to make and to sustain change. So as a youth progresses through the stages and the confidence in their ability increases, the temptation to re-engage in that behavior decreases. So self-efficacy tends to be especially important in the later stages and is very important in terms of relapse prevention when working with youth. So helping them identify tempting situations and coming up with strategies to manage them helps to ensure their success in maintaining the change. Well, Miles, I'm wondering if I can ask you again to maybe talk about some of the strategies you've used to help build youth confidence in their ability to change? Sure. So. Uh, one of the biggest things that we do here is we celebrate success um, here at New Beginnings. Um, you know, when we're talking about a young person who maybe hasn't gone to school in a year or two um, and they were to show up once a week, we celebrate that success here. Um, if we have a young person who has never had a job and they showed up, um, you know, to one out of 10 uh, days of training for our employment program, we celebrate them uh, them attending and just know that that's a, pro you know, a progress for them on the stages of change. Um, and we will celebrate that progress with them um, and then really help them understand how um, how that progress is helping uh, shape some of those strengths that they're really working towards. Um, so we're always talking about goals. We're always talking uh, about their strengths um, and we're always looking at plans for how they can accomplish that and how we can help support them with that. Um, everything we do here at New Beginnings is um, youth driven and goal driven. Um, so we're always asking them, you know, mom and dad might be talking about, um, you know, they need to be doing X, Y, and Z, but we're asking the young people at the end of the day, um, where do you see yourself? What do you need to be working on? What do you think that you, you know, what do you want help with at this point? Um, and then really starting somewhere and being able to build off of those strengths. So again, celebrating those successes is key for us. Um, sometimes it's as small as a hot chocolate um, or a certificate, a frame certificate we've done for young people. Um, that have attended one day out of a training program um, that they've never had any success in before. Um, and really, uh, again, turning that uh, success back on our, our funders as well and showing them and celebrating that and saying, like, this person hasn't had any success in the last five years, um, but we've been able to get them to attend some training that they've never been able to attend before. And we were able to create a unique, um, you know, program for them or service um, that was uh, catered to what their needs are and they've actually experienced some success there. It wasn't the ultimate end goal that we're all looking for, but at least they attained some success and we'd like to build on that success now. And, and it does take time. Um, Vivian, as you pointed out in a lot of those slides, um, being in those stages can be a very, very long time before you're progressing. Um, and I, I think as long as uh, you're willing to dedicate the time and the resources uh, to be able to support that for that young person, um, in whatever stage of change they are at, I think that you will see the benefits at the end of the day. Great, thank you. 
So I think this is the point where we were going to look at a um, real case scenario, but I'm not sure if Liqua has had the opportunity to join us yet. Not yet. We're just waiting on him to join us. And I wonder while we're waiting, um, I don't know if you both want to speak to a question that we received from one of our participants um, around how do you, uh, as a youth worker, how do you mitigate the different approaches that other people in the young person's life who occupy different roles, family members, peers, maybe other practitioners might take in supporting or hindering a young person who is um, looking to make a change in their lives? That's a great question. Uh, Miles, did you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, I, I can jump in and uh, I think you've really hit the nail on the head, whoever asked that question. Um, it's frustrating. Um, it's frustrating a lot of times when we're trying to advocate for a young person um, and from that strengths-based approach and, and you know people may be seeing a case file that's been open and closed maybe five or six seven eight nine ten times um, with their organization and they're like okay what's the point now like we know what's going to happen um, but at that point I think for us it's all about ad um, advocacy um, to be able to support that young person and really be able to build um, a case um, I can give you a specific example um, we have a, an employment program that's uh, quite restrictive sometimes. Um, and I had a CAS worker call me um, and say, Miles, like this, this person is ready to go. Um, they're really motivated for change. She failed out of the program the first time. Is there any way that we can look at re-engaging her in this program? Um, and I said, unfortunately, from the funder point of view, no. Um, and we kind of hung up the phone at that point. And I called her back a few minutes later and I said, you know what? Send me something in writing. Send me something on your letterhead that says like, if we do something good now, something good is going to come from this. Um, so I took that letter and I forwarded it to our funder and I said, if we don't put this person back in the employment program, then what's the point of running this employment program? Um, and our funder actually came back to us. She said, yeah, no problem, make an exception for it. And what I've done is I've actually now been sending her updates as to what's been happening with that young person um, throughout their employment journey. And she's been able to maintain that employment journey. So um, that's obviously like a, you know, a, a perfect case example of how, how things can work. Um, but I think advocating for yourself and your agency, your organization, um, and being able to show them like, you know what, we've been able to build on these strengths. Um, they've identified X, Y, and Z as their plan. They've never been able to identify that before. Um, so is, is there any way that we can kind of look at, at creating a new file or a new system? Um, and we're more than happy to be able to go into a room and be able to say like, no, like we're, we're not talking um, about a young person anymore. We're talking about Joey or Kristen or whoever um, that name might be and be able to to legitimize you know, the work that we're doing. Um, but it is a frustration, absolutely, especially when people have to work in the systems. Um, and one other um, side note on that is, um, you know, at the end of the day, we are also the system. So as much as we wanna blame that system, I do think that we also have to acknowledge like we are in the system and we are um, actively participating in it as well. Um, so if we are blaming the system, we really do need to make changes to it. Um, and it can only happen from, uh, from the inside out. So. Um, I do see a role in all organizations playing in that kind of piece of it, but uh, it's certainly a frustration, absolutely. And what about family members um, or caregivers? How or where would you um, maybe best engage the sort of social supports or the structures in a young person's life um, in working with them to move them to the next stage of change? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, again, um, you know, we can do all the work in the world between 9 and 5 or 10 to 6 or 11 to 7, um, whatever your shift might be. Um, but at the end of the day, that young person is going back home um, and, and is going to be there for the next 10, 12, you know, 15 hours before we can come back in the next day, and maybe continue some of that work that we've been doing. So it's very easy to, to kind of look at, un, uh, you know, some of that work being undone. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what we try and do, we try and wrap that family around with support as well. So we're very, very lucky here um, with the um, supports and programs that we have at New Beginnings that we've been able to actively include a family component in all of our programs uh, to be able to engage that family member um, or family members at home to say like, you know, this is what we're trying to work towards and we really need your support behind this as well. Um, but engaging that young person in that conversation as well, like if there's a behavior at home that isn't working for one or both, um, you know, what can be done to, to kind of uh, look at that behavior and, and kind of make it work for everybody at the end of the day. Uh, you know, enter negotiations um, is certainly something that we do uh, very, very uh, frequently. So, um, you know, certainly engaging the family in the process as well. 
Um, identifying family strengths is another thing. Um, you know, I, I don't want to keep beating the horn of a strengths-based approach, but it really, really does work um, as long as you live and breathe it. And I, I hope that you're showing that we live and breathe it here um, at New Beginnings. And uh, I hope that if anything, this might be able to push a little, a few other people to kind of look at that as well. And um, a couple of things you mentioned, Miles, we're going to be talking about in part two as well, where we have those discussions with youth around environmental reevaluation and how their behavior influences their environment and vice versa. And what are the things around them that support the behavior change and what are some things that hinder and having those discussions at, at the forefront to plan and to um, look at ways to strategize through them. And that could include peer groups that may um, not be a positive influence or family members that may um, attempt to sabotage the behavior change. Are there any other questions, Katie, or do we know if Liqua is now on the call? Or? Um, he will be joining us very shortly, uh, but in the meantime, some more questions are coming up from folks. Um, and, and one question that's come up a few times in a few different ways is, you know, I think, um, Vivian, you spoke to how youth in the preparation stage are sort of the ideal program participants. Um, how can we effectively engage youth in our programs who may not be at that stage yet? What are some strategies that we might use um, to get them there? Or is that the right approach? For youth that are in the pre-contemplation stage? They may be. Um, uh, they may be in the uh, pre-contemplation stage, maybe they're in the contemplation stage, maybe we don't know exactly where they're at, but they're not quite in the preparation stage yet. Well, the model really supports um, educating and informing youth around um, the consequences of the behavior, not in a punitive way, but around just around informing them and educating them around uh, what are the long-term impacts potentially of uh, what they're doing and continuing to have those conversations with them around what would be the benefits of stopping that particular behavior and, and making the change and really um, supporting them in um, that change talk, right? Um, what could it look like? Is it possible? And starting to get them to think about maybe it is possible, maybe it isn't um, as, un, you know, achievable as, as I think it is. And it really supports um, a level intervention where you're having frequent contacts, and it may not be long contacts, but frequent and supportive, um, and continuing to remind them that this is available and that um, they are capable and that you would support them. Miles, I'm not sure if there's any other strategies that you would recommend during those initial stages I, I i think you kind of covered my pieces of it um at this point so um yeah i can't really think of anything else to include at this point okay. and i think um in addition to that you know a lot of praise and support and and recognition um and problem solving go a long way um with youth who aren't quite ready to start preparing um, or to make that commitment. So just, again, with that strengths-based approach to practice, right? And finding opportunities for them to be successful. Should we go to another question, Katie? Sure, we can absolutely do that. I'm wondering, um, someone asked about metaphors for the stages of change. Um, when you're working with a young person, if you're um, working to sort of um, meet them where they're at and move them along, are there metaphors that practitioners can use without referring to the sort of trans theoretical model? Um, are there ways to speak to the stages of change using metaphors? Is that something that, that has come up for you in your work? Miles, do you use metaphors or? I can't really think of any specific example. Um, I think for us, a lot of times this, you know, the stages of change for us is kind of in the background. 
um, for us as a, as a staff team in that, you know, it, that work is kind of happening sometimes in the background, almost automatic at this point. So I don't know, really know that we're really actively engaging young people in a conversation. Like I feel as if you're in the preparation stage of the stage of the change. Um, but we're more using as a model in terms of how we would kind of organize some of that work that we're looking at. Um, and at this point, um, with an experienced staff team, we're kind of using it um, almost in the background and almost as an automatic uh, kind of uh, way of uh, working with young people at this point. So I can't really think of any sort of specific metaphor that we might be using um, here that would kind of uh, be able to inform you a little bit. So sorry about that. I can't think of one offhand, but I'm going to definitely try and find one now. Uh, this is Liquid joining. Can you hear me? Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> Sorry, late to, late to the party, but we do have a metaphor. Um, some of our, our workers use stepping stones, and we just talk about, um, you know, in, in every journey, there's things that you need to do, and these are just the stepping stones along the path, um, as opposed to calling it um, stages of change. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm wondering now, if perhaps we can hand it over to you, Liqua, to talk to us a little bit about your case study and Kendra and what the stages of change might look like for her. Thank you. Um, so by way of introduction, I, I think you got the bio. I'm Liqua Gala from East Metro Youth Services. And we had the privilege of uh, working with folks at York University, um, specifically Drs. Noel, um, Deb Pepler, and Wendy Josephson, um, looking at the Youth Outreach Worker Program and trying to find an evidence-based or informed model that captured the work we were doing. And so the stages of change is something that we looked at. And with Dr. Noel, uh, youth workers, or about 10 youth workers and three managers worked with him around how could we adapt this um, trans-theoretical model that Vivian has, has, has presented uh, and apply it to the youth world. Um, and I think Miles has been giving you the experience on, on their end at New Beginnings um, in Windsor. So one of the case studies that we used in the initial training for the youth workers in 2012, and this was based off of live data, live situation, name has obviously been changed. Um, in the first contact, you know, so we employ something we call the um, contact and encounter theory. So every interaction with a young person is a contact. What is happening within that encounter? What are you seeing? What are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And then what do you need to do to prepare for the next encounter to help the young person move along? Um, and in the encounter, you're trying to identify what are the issues that are presenting. Um, and within the program, when we say an issue presenting, and, and by issue, we mean things like, what are they dealing with? Is it homelessness, housing? Um, is it um, income support? Is it employment? We identify an issue when the young person, it has, when it has come up in the conversation. It might be that the young person has presented it, or it could be that um, even though they haven't presented it, but it, the youth worker will try and bring it up in the conversation. So there is a discussion, so you can find out what is the young person's attitude to that particular issue. So we're presenting Kendra. Um, young person, 16 years old, um, living um, on the streets when the youth outreach worker comes to, 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 to meet with them. Um, she's pregnant. And clearly, there's, uh, there's a lot happening, very connected to her boyfriend, who is maybe one or two years older. And, and, and they're, 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 they're on the streets together. These are like sort of, um, I think the term used to be called squeegee youth um, in, in Toronto, where they're, they're street involved and, and, and very young. But there seems to be a either a reluctance or something preventing them from being within that sort of service provider shelter to group home housing situation. And we know that a lot of young people in care sometimes do wind up on the street. So the youth worker is trying to see how they can be of help in this first encounter. Um, and, and the things that are coming up is definitely that the housing is an issue. There is a lot of concern about um, the, 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 the baby, the, un the unborn child, because there's been no prenatal care or coverage that has been um, afforded to, to Kendra. And so this all comes up in, in that first encounter, and the youth worker is like, look, I can get you into the community health center. Um, young person, Kendra, says, look, I've been there before, and it, it just wasn't a good outcome for them. 
Um, so, so youth workers committing to look, let, let me see what I can do for you. And then, so that's the end of the first encounter. The youth worker goes, um, checks in with the service providers at the health center. They say that for sure, we can we, we can accommodate, we can see Canberra, we, we actually know the couple, we know of the couple, they've tried to access our services before. So the youth worker is doing their advocacy piece around trying to make it easier for, for Canberra to be able to access services. Um, so employing the stages of change model, what the youth worker would do um, at the end of this first encounter is just try to determine, so what was Kendra's attitude to the services that were being offered, especially in relation to the issues that Kendra's facing? Um, the issues that are identified, clearly there's a housing issue. Um, this is a homeless young person. Clearly there's some, some primary health and prenatal care issues, just in terms of how they're going to be able to, um, to support um, the baby that is coming in, in about three months. Um, there's definitely issues around, you know, um, just common basic documentation around their ID um, and, 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 and income clearly. So, so that is something we would make note of um, in, within our database. If you move on to the, to the second contact, um, this is the following day. The worker has taken time to, to um, connect with the health center and the health center is willing for Kendra to come in. Um, so Kendra is found at the same place. Um, the explanation is given to Kendra, and Kendra says, "You know what? I am. This is great. I was really looking for this support, um, and by going into the health center, it's actually going to make it easier for them to to to, to get onto a waiting list for housing. So the health center is going to help with that primary care piece and the prenatal care, just just her medical stuff that's going on, but." It, being a client at the health center is going to help with the housing piece. And so for us, what we're saying at this stage is this is a young person who is um, not just willing and contemplating or thinking about um, the stuff that they need and, and the help they need, but they're actually starting to make those first steps around being able to, to, to get the support. Um, and, and so, you know, um, one of the difficulties we found in, in rolling out of the stages of change within the program is there are times when there's a, a difficulty between placing someone in the contemplation or preparation stage because there's a lot of the attributes of, of contemplation, but there's some of the attributes of preparation because some work is being done to actually get ready um, for, the, for, for, the, for, the, for the next part of the intervention. A couple of days later, um, the youth worker goes and looks for Kendra and doesn't find Kendra um, in the same place. So that is not a contact, obviously, um, because Kendra was, was not seen. And then about four or five days later, um, this is the third contact. This is the third time that we're seeing Kendra. And um, Kendra has moved, no longer at the same place where they were before and is very agitated when asked about you know what's happening have has she followed through on on the on on the on the help that had been sought and was being offered by the community health center and actually does not want to engage anymore with the um with the worker and so at that point um this is when we're really talking about the recidivism or the relapse where this young person is now going back into pre-contemplation where they're no longer looking at, they're no longer willing to take the steps or, or willing to accept that they need support with something. And I, I think this has come up, um, I'm sure, um, earlier as you were talking about the model, that this is one of those sort of normal things that happens. So we tried to pick up a very basic example of what may happen um, when we're doing the work. Um, I don't know if this disclaimer was put out earlier, for most of us in the Youth Outreach Worker Program, we're not clinicians. Um, so these are youth workers um, engaging with young people who are technically not considered clients, but there is a lot of therapeutic work that does happen um, with, within the multiple interactions that we have. Um, and it is possible to utilize the stages of change in helping a young person over um, multiple interactions. We sometimes see the same young person as many as 20 or 30 times to be able to get them to a stage where where um, they've moved into maintenance and, and we're terminating. But in this example, um, which is a very typical example for the disengaged young people we work with, we were only able to get to a preparation phase um, and then there was pre-contemplation. The example ended there. Um, I, I don't have the data on what happened thereafter, uh, but I'm curious uh, from folks, I don't know if there's questions, just in terms of how we have been employing uh, the stages of change um, in this context.
thank you, Liqua, for helping us to uh, apply some of these concepts um, to practice. Katie, do you have any questions come in specifically around the case study? Not specifically around the case study, but I think um, there will be questions that um, our guests will be able to speak to when we move into that section of the, of the presentation. I think if I may, Vivian, if I, if I may say, um, one of the things that was important for us in adopting stages of change as as a, as a model for the for the program, the recognition, the burden for many uh, youth workers, especially working with uh, marginalized or disconnected young people, was sometimes trying to demonstrate that progress did happen, that something did did take place and that there was a benefit to having the worker in the young person's life. Because a lot of our funders, you know, sort of just look at those, those outcomes in terms of how many people went into a program and graduated. Um, and many times we're working with young people where just getting them to have at least come to the program one time is a huge success because they were at least able to move from where they were before, where they were not even attempting to um, enter the doors of some service provider or, or engage with the service system. So it, 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 it's, it's good in, in two ways. It's good for the workers to see that there is progress happening. There is some good that they're doing. And then it gives them a model that they can look at and then try to determine what could I have done differently? Well, what else needed to be present for this intervention to 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 to, to have been more successful? But going back to the, the 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 metaphor of stepping stones, like I said, it also empowers the young person to see that I was able to move from point A to point B. I was able to do it. Um, so it it can motivate them to be willing to try to move from point B to point C. Thank you. So I believe that brings us to our summary or lessons so far. Yeah. So just to recap, and then we'll, we'll go to questions again. Um, some of the key points that uh, we want to highlight from the webinar is that change doesn't necessarily mean action. It means progress. And supporting a young person to move just one stage increases the likelihood of success or action in the future. Great success breeds success. So our goal with the uh, stages of change is to move the young person to the next stage and not to think too far down the road because it could be overwhelming. So focusing on one transition at a time will likely result in less resistance or make the youth feel less overwhelmed. Um, the last point that we want to make is that we're going to be talking about in part two some of the trans stage mass stage match principles and how we can facilitate the stage progression. So what are some of the strategies for each of the stages with the processes of change? We're going to match those up and talk about that. And lastly, um, the effects of the TTM interventions increase over time even after the intervention ends. So again, if we're able to move someone just one stage, we're more likely to see success or action down the line because they see some success themselves. So I guess at this point, we'll go to the questions. Katie, will you be able to provide us with some? I don't see them on my end. Sure, we had just a few like reflection questions. So questions that you might think about in your practice, how you can use the stages of change in your work with youth, what are some situations in which using a stages of change approach could be difficult, and how do you manage those situations in order to stay on track? And I think a lot of the, the questions that we've received speak to some of the reflecting that you've all been doing throughout the webinar today. I'll start with a question. Um, it's specific, but I, I think it will apply to a lot of folks maybe who work in the sector. For practitioners who um, are basically, you know, 
only able to work with a young person um, uh, through uh, brief periods of contact. So it could be a single session or it could be a mandated number of sessions. Are there strategies for how you might use this approach um, when you are working with a young person? You know, you may only have one opportunity to sit with them or you may have um, a certain number of sessions. You may not be building that relationship in the long term, but in the short term, how can you use the stages of change to support that young person in making change? Are there any uh, experiences or strategies that, that our guests can share around that piece? Do either of my experts on the panel want to address that? Liquid, do you want to jump in on that one? Hey, Katie, could, could you read the, the, la the last three lines of the question again, please? For, for practitioners who only have a certain amount of time with a young person, it might be a single session, it might be through a helpline, it might be through um, only a couple of sessions, they may only yep. be able to work with the young person in the short term. What are some strategies um, that folks could, could use thinking about a stages of change approach? Um, so for, for us, unfortunately, it does happen that we only get um, one yeah. session with the young person. What I would say is it, it, it's about chunking it within that session. So whether it's a 90, like, like I know people who do like um, brief narrative therapy and they're looking at like a, a 90 minute session, like in a WhatsApp walk-in clinic, for, for example, um, trying to quickly assess at the beginning the person's attitude, that could be done either at the beginning of the session or if there was an intake form, just if there was sort of like a pre-questionnaire coming in through intake, just get, getting a sense of where that young person is based on what they filled in through their intake form or how they registered um, to, to, to come into that session or what they said if it was a, if it's a, if it's a call-in number and they've called in and they're like, I, I've been told to call in. Sometimes people are voluntold because maybe it's a youth justice um, issue and, and you know you you need to speak to somebody before you come back to court sort of situation. So getting a sense of what is their attitude at the beginning of the session and then trying to employ the same strategies within that limited time, which might just be that one call or one session, to try to at least move them into the next piece, to the next stage where they, they now want to come back for more. Because I, I think, the model works when there are multiple engagements. And so if, if the only success you achieve is making a person who was only going to come one time want to come back a second time, or at least want to seek further help from another professional or service provider, then to me, that, 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 that would be a good success. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Someone asked a question around, you know, obviously stages of change applying this model to behavior changes. That's what we're speaking to. It's the trans theoretical model of behavior change. But um, do you have any examples or any approaches to applying this model to attitudinal change? Uh, how much of that is part of um, the process of behavior change? Someone asked specifically around changing a young person's attitudes. Um. So I know that when we're talking about youth that are in the um, pre-contemplation contemplation stage, they um, are more so in the pre-contemplation, they aren't really interested in talking about or thinking about change that ready. So their attitude is that um, either they're not interested, they're not going to benefit from it um, in any way. And whatever they're doing now is, is working for them. So it's really our role um, to help them see things from a different perspective. And we're going to talk about in more in detail um, in part two some different strategies to kind of help them shift their mindset around you know, consciousness raising and informing them, like I said before, around the benefits of possibly um, taking on um, that change and some of the long-term consequences maybe they don't know about or they're not aware about that could be a result of the the behavior that they're they're currently demonstrating um miles really would you have like a real life example maybe of how you've helped shift a youth's attitude in those uh, early earlier stages specifically um 
I, I can give a quick example. Um, the pre getting a young person to move from pre contemplation to contemplation is is, re, is really hard. Um, and when I was managing staff directly, I, I think there were times when I would direct them to not spend too much time on the folks in pre contemplation and hope that because they're working with a group of young people in a community, their success with other young people would help that young person who has an attitude of, I don't need you, or, or there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, when they start to see positive things happen for somebody else, that, um, like that, that that'll be the carrot for them. Um, so one of the stories that I've told um, in the past is on an airplane, you know, if someone is, is, is frustrated on an airplane because, you know, and this is an experience that I've had, um, when you're traveling and you, you, you don't get your, your overhead baggage um, and, uh, over the seat that you have so where you can put your bag, like your carry-on your, your carry luggage. And I've seen people get like really upset because like, you know, this is the seat that I bought, like things should be here. But in their agitation, they're actually making other people nervous. And then when other people get nervous, that could actually result in dire consequences for this person who is justifiably upset about something. And so we try and use those um, examples, e even for young people, sometimes when they're really agitated with how, let's say a teacher has dealt with them at school. Th their behavior in that moment what it might have been justified that they have a problem with what's going on can actually create a different scenario. So if you already have youth justice issues, maybe you were arrested as a young person, you've got conditions that you're supposed to comply with, then all of a sudden you're getting into an altercation with other people at school, primarily people in authority like teachers and principals, that's an administrative charge, you're not comply, com, 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 complying with your conditions, so you're actually making things worse for yourself. So trying to give them examples where they can see that, you know, maybe if we can just shift your attitudes to this thing, we can actually start to shift the outcomes of what's happening for you. Thank you. So we do still have a little bit of time. Um, can we go to another question? Absolutely. Um, someone is asking about working with a young person who may um, be struggling with mental health and they may not necessarily have even the insights into their own behavior or that those insights may be um, may be challenged by their own mental health. They may um, their, their propensity for change may be impacted. And so what uh, strategies um, or examples can you provide of working with a young person who may be um, may be challenged by their mental health in those ways. So I can give a strategy, not necessarily an example. As I said before, I'm not a clinician, um, and most of the, the youth outreach workers that I've supervised um, weren't clinicians either. But one thing we know is um, employing motivational interview, which is an evidence-based um, uh, way of speaking with, assessing, and intervening with the young person, and really works well hand-in-hand -hand with uh, stages of change is, I would say, is key. Um, I think if, especially if you know that there are going to be mental health type challenges with the young people that you're working with, I would invest in getting some motivational interviewing training. Yeah, look, well, I had touched on that earlier as well, and that's really helped our staff here as well. Uh, it provides a really nice foundation in terms of how to kind of engage in some of those conversations um, as well. So I certainly would recommend that myself as well. Thank you. Someone asked a question around advice that you might offer supportive parents who are just feeling really frustrated when their teen is stuck between contemplation and action or moving between these stages with frequent relapse. And I, I imagine that for youth workers who have developed relationships um, with the young people with whom they work, that they can also feel a similar frustration. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to your experiences of that or, or how you might um, in your own work uh, mitigate, you know, and be reflective of your own frustrations, but then support other people in, in the young person's life around frustrations in terms of progressing through the stages of change or relapse, which, you know, we talked about is an opportunity and not a failure, but for the people in a young person's life, maybe it doesn't feel that way all the time. We, as I, sorry, uh, as we, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, for us, it was a really difficult task in terms of really understanding that relapse piece and really, um, 
you know, taking that um, as part of the model. Um, and I, I think providing that education to parents um, or family members or whoever might be in the young person's life um, really is an opportunity for us to, to educate um, and provide that knowledge, share that knowledge, um, and then also kind of tell them what our personal experiences are as well. So I, I've shared a, a few here and, and certainly we would be sharing those as well. Um, I think for us here is that we very, very consistently get um, a lot of phone calls from frustrated parents who've had to go around and through this system. Um, they've been to multiple children's mental health organizations or employment programs or whatever that might be, uh, just trying to get help. So um, we really like to try and remove some of those barriers. Um, and just by doing that, they automatically open up a little bit more and kind of already um, buy into to the model that we are kind of using here at New Beginnings. So I think that that certainly does work as well as uh, working in that system um, and uh, trying to help them navigate that and being, you know, beside them the entire time and through that. Um, certainly, if, if you're a, a one session type uh, clinician, it might be a little bit more difficult to be able to provide that level of support. Um, but certainly education in terms of um, it's going to happen and it may happen again. Um, but just know like each time it may be getting better and uh, to try and build on some of those strengths that are happening. So, like, well, I know you had something to say as well. Uh, uh, so I would just say additionally, thank you, Miles. I'll say additionally that um, it's also about reframing what is happening for the parents. Um, child is not the problem. There is a problem that is being faced. And so the youth, their child is, is dealing with this, but the parents themselves are dealing with it too. So I like to look at ever since I, I, I got onto stages of change in 2012, I look at everything around me um, within, within the stages of change framework. So the parents are coming within a particular stage of change with regards to the young person and the behavior that is going on. So how are you working with them within, within the framework of the model to get them to a place where um, their attitude towards the, the young person being a problem or needing support is changing to how they are also getting the help and education, as Mal said. So it might be that you're, you're creating two plans, a plan for the young person, but a plan for the parents as well, which actually helps bring the young person in when they recognize that I'm, I'm, I'm not being treated as the problem here. I'm getting support. My parents are getting support. My, my caregivers are getting support too. And ultimately, we're, we're, we're trying to drive at, at, at the same outcome, which is some, some type of balance or positivity within, with, within the home or the family unit. Another question came up around the possibilities for using this model. I mean, obviously, we're meeting individual youth where they're at, but is there any benefit or do you have any experience um, in a group setting working through the stages of change and how, how that might uh, affect the way in which you approach using this model? I think it could. I, I, I haven't used it in a group setting, I, I have to be honest, but I, I do think that the concepts of it can work. Um, groups have, you know, you know the, the group dynamics, you come together, you're forming, you're storming, um, but I think um, if, if, if there is a, a, an agreed issue or an identified issue that a group is coming together for and people are starting at relatively the same place, I, I do think you could use the, the, the pathway or the framework of, of stages of change um, in that setting. Yeah, we're the same. We haven't specifically used it in a group setting. Um, we do hold groups here, so I think probably our staff are using some of those skills that they've been able to, to kind of use, but uh, we haven't specifically used it um, for a group setting um, in that kind of uh, context. We definitely have had more questions than we've had time to address, um, and I, I think, you know, Based on the time now, I think it's a good opportunity for us to sort of wrap up today's presentation. But uh, I, I did want to say if anyone has a question that they they feel that they they still hadn't had addressed um, over the course of this presentation, please feel free to email us at rexweb, R-E-X-W-E-B, as in Bob, at yorku.ca. And we'll do our best to respond to those questions. And uh, also remember, there is a part two to this series. I don't know, Vivian, if you want to share a little bit about what we will be covering in part two of this series. So in part two, we're going to talk about the uh, processes of change, which is the fourth uh, construct in the trans theoretical model. And we're going to talk about five experiential and five behavioral change process that will help you uh, better understand how youth work their way through these stages. And we're gonna talk about some stage mass principles and strategies for actually 
working with youth, so some ways to support them in each of the stages that you can uh, apply to your work. And then we're going to be touching on motivational interviewing and how it really does complement the TTM and some motivational interviewing strategies that you can couple with um, the stages of change to help your youth be more successful on their change journey.